It's time for us to come together for evening worship as we book in our Lord's Day uh, in worship. To come in the morning and the evening to celebrate the full day of the Sabbath, the full day of blessings. And so we are here to worship our God in spirit and in truth together. There are a couple announcements I want to highlight on page 13 of your bulletin. Um, let me again remind you that this week is the drive through dinner. Um, we're going to have ham and the, the fixings. Um, and so if you would like to reserve plates, please do so uh, by the end of the office day um, tomorrow by calling the church or emailing the church. But also if you can sign up yourself on the church office door if you would like. But that deadline is tomorrow. Uh, also, um, the still a few of the women in the church that were involved in the formation of our cookbook wanted to remind everybody that there are cookbooks available for $20 a book. Um, and I hear they make good Christmas presents. Um, and so, uh, please, uh, please feel free to, to purchase those from one of the women in the church or the church office uh, if you would like uh, to uh, give those away as gifts. Also, again, uh, next evening, uh, during the same hour, we're going to have an evening of lessons and carols uh, instead of our normal uh, 6 p.m. worship service. And then also, just a reminder that Christmas Eve service is at 4.30 uh, this year out on the front uh, lawn of the church. Um, and so please make plans to come uh, worship with us on that Christmas Eve service that we know and love so well. Now as we uh, enter into worship, God, of course, calls us to worship in his word. One of my favorite scripture texts is there in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 discussing Israel's joy and restoration as the prophet writes, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, and shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away the judgments against you, and he has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let your hands not grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. Isn't it a good, a good thing that as we even stand to sing our first hymn here in just a few moments, that the heavens above are singing along with us, and God our Savior is singing over us. And so let us stand, or let us first pray, and then we'll stand uh, and sing. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Lord, we come through Christ. Lord, we come by the power of your Spirit. And we come to you. Uh, Lord, we remind ourselves that we who are wicked fathers, earthly fathers, uh, know how to give good gifts to our children, desire to. Your word says, how much more will our Heavenly Father give what is good? To those who ask. So, Father, we do come. We ask that you would uh, grant us strength to worship. We ask that you grant us the blessing of being able to enter into worship and that this time would be pleasing to you. It is to you that we come. Our Father, we do now come together uh, to pray to you and to pray the way uh, which, you taught your which you taught your disciples to pray as we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let us come and sing to our God uh, in your bulletin. You'll see on page nine our first hymn for tonight printed out. Uh, and you'll notice in this hymn that we worship our triune God. We come to our Father, the incarnate word. We call upon the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to enable us to do this as we call upon our God. Uh, let us stand as you are able and we'll sing together the hymn of praise, Come Thou Almighty King. 
As we continue in our service, as we have sung praise to our God, it is good for us to come, though we have been forgiven of our sins, it is good, and we are told in 1 John to do so, to come and confess our sins to our God and Father. So let us now pray together the corporate confession of sin that is printed out on page 8. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief, and of neglect to seek you in my daily life. My sins and shortcomings present me with a list of accusations, but I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver me from every evil habit, every interest this scriptural assurance of pardon, this assurance from God's word, from Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. David says here, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. Well, let us uh, go to God uh, in prayer together uh, tonight. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Father, we come to you as a, a congregation. We come as fellow brothers and sisters. Father, we come as your children, as those whom you've made children. Lord, as I often pray, because I need to remind myself, your word says that it was by your doing that we are in Christ Jesus. Lord, it's because of your love for us, uh, people who you have foreknown before the foundation of the earth, who you set your love upon, who you decided out of love to send your son to come and live, to be born of a virgin and live a, a sinless life, and to die 
a sacrificial death in our place that we might be forgiven, Lord. You did that because of your love for us. Father, we come to you, our Heavenly Father, so grateful that we can come knowing that you know everything about us, praying that you see everything and knowing that you do see everything in us, Lord, and yet you still love us. Uh, we thank you that we are accepted in the beloved. It is not because of our righteousness. Uh, we do not need to try to earn your favor. Uh, you offer us salvation freely in Christ. And Lord, we thank you that we can walk freely before you, knowing that our righteousness is seated in heaven at your right hand. Heavenly Father, we pray for strength as we continue this, this walk of faith. We pray that you would continue this work in us, which you yourself have begun. Lord, that as we even just pray, that you would help us to turn from indwelling sin, that you'd help us to turn from those things that still plague us, that you would help us to see the, the sinfulness of sin, of turning away and not seeing you as who you really are, that you'd help us to see the sinfulness of turning to those things which do not satisfy, and you'd help us to remember and be assured that there is only grace when, we, when your children turn to you, that there are open arms, that there's healing and restoration. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that this time of the year has come upon us when we uh, specifically remember you sending your Son, Lord Jesus, as we remember your birth, your entrance, into this world as a human being, we thank you that there is no temptation that we face that you are not aware of. There's nothing, you are able to sympathize with us, uh, not because you sinned, you never sinned, but you were tempted in all ways as we are. And we can come to you and you don't turn us away saying, I don't understand, I don't know what you're talking about. We come to a sympathetic high priest Lord, we do come to you again, and, and we rejoice um, that, Father, you, you have sent a Savior into this world. Lord, we do pray as this, this season comes upon us that it would be a time in, in this church, and a time in our own families and our own personal lives that is one in which you are honored and glorified. Lord, we are dependent on you for everything. You are dependent on us for nothing. You don't need our worship. But you give us the honor of coming and enjoying and the privilege of coming and partaking in your worship, of being around you. You allow us and, and call us to you, and it is a great privilege and honor to do so. Father, we pray you'd continue to be with Dillon Christian School. We pray you'd be with the students there and the teachers and administration as well. Father, we do pray for our public schools as well. We pray for the kids there and the teachers and administration. And Father, we pray for our homeschool parents and, and students as well, that you continue uh, to help all of us, uh, to help teach the younger generation about you, that they might go forth and not go the way of this culture, Lord, that they'd go forth the way of your word. Lord, we lift them up to you and we pray for our kids. Please grant them your spirit, Lord. Bring life there and help them to know you and know that uh, the Bible is true. Heavenly Father, we do pray for our college students as well. Would you be with them in what is very often difficult circumstances to be a Christian? Uh, we pray that you would give them boldness. We pray that you'd give them grace. Uh, we pray that you would protect them from the evil one. We pray that you'd be with them uh, even from this, this pandemic that we continue to go through as well. Father, we do want to pray for those who are sick and those who are struggling whether that be from COVID or anything else. Uh, we pray for those who are lonely and struggling. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be aware uh, that you'd even put on our minds those who might need a, a call or a visit. Um, and Lord, we pray you would grant your presence to those who are suffering and are lonely right now as well. Heavenly Father, we are so blessed. We pray just that you would continue to help us to walk by faith, and Lord, that we would have confidence in the fact that you will save all of your people. May we go forth with that confidence as we meet with relatives and others who do not know you this, this holiday season. 
that we would be bold and loving to, to share the gospel, Lord, knowing again that you will bring life where there is none. If they are your people, they will not get away. Their eyes will be opened. May we have that confidence. Um, our Father, we ask that tonight you'd be with Matt as he brings your word to us. Lord, would you grant out of your grace alone uh, that we might be strengthened by your word. Father, we thank you that we are able to come. This is, a, again, a great privilege, and uh, we ask that you'd bless this time. We thank you, Father. We pray that our hearts love you. We pray that you'd help us to understand more and more how much you love us. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Don. As we uh, prepare ourselves for... Uh, looking at Acts chapter 18, there's an announcement that I forgot to mention. In your bulletin, it says that our hymn of response was the first Noel. Um, in our foreman of the services for this Lord's Day, both morning and evening, we uh, moved some things around uh, at the end of the week. And we moved the first Noel to this morning, as many of you know. Uh, and we moved uh, a hymn that we were, are going to sing, The Advent of Our King. Uh, to this evening as it uh, concludes our service. And so just just that note, that the hymn on page 12 of your bulletin is the correct hymn that we are singing. Now, if you'll uh, open your own copies of God's Word uh, or uh, the bulletin to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, if you are using your bulletin, of course that uh, scripture there is on page 10. You also have a pew Bible there uh, if you would like to uh, use that. But we are looking at the first 17 verses of Acts chapter 18. And I, uh, I think that one of, one of the events, or really the main event that happens in these first 17 verses of this 18th chapter is really crucial uh, when it comes to the, the mission of the Apostle Paul, the ministry of the Apostle Paul, because it's is here that, that Paul is going to declare a statement that will be revolutionary uh, up to our point in Acts. You know, it's been his tradition, it's been his actions that in each new city in which he goes, he goes first to uh, the synagogue, or he finds those Jewish believers, and, and yet here in our text what we'll see is uh, he moves away, he he brushes off his feet from going to the synagogue in each new city, and he declares that he is going um, now to the Gentiles first. And, and even as we think about that, even before we read, um, it is from this city uh, that Paul will write his letter to the Romans, where he struggles in uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 with these very things. What is the relationship uh, between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church. Well, uh, the roots of that conversation unfold before our eyes here uh, in the 18th chapter. And so before we read, let's ask that the Lord would give us ears to hear. Father in heaven, we do come again uh, to ask you that you would impart to us more of your spirit so that we may have uh, ears to hear your word. Father, we know that this is how you speak to us. Uh, this is how you have revealed yourself to us. You have spoken, and now we, your servants, uh, long to hear you. Uh, but we know that it is only a gift of grace that we have those ears. And so we do come asking uh, that you would give us uh, the ability to hear you speak, that we would have the ability to see uh, Christ and the gospel, that we would have the ability, the ability to understand it. Uh, and for it to change us. And so, Father, we pray that you would do a mighty work even in this time of the reading and preaching of your word. And so we ask all of these things for your glory and in your son's name. Amen. All right, let's read the first 17 verses of this 18th chapter. People of God, hear the word of God. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. 
and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we left Paul last week, we left him uh, in Athens. And you remember there in Athens, he was uh, troubled by the things that he saw amongst the city. Uh, despite their uh, wisdom and despite their scholarship and despite their grand architecture and everything of the sort, Paul was troubled in his heart because he noticed that they worshipped many gods, including uh, themselves. And so as Paul uh, was troubled in his spirit amongst these things, we remember that he began to evangelized there in the synagogues and in the marketplaces, finally going before the, the Aeropagus to, to debate and to engage with these, these two schools of philosophical thought. And there it is that he began, to, he began to preach. He began to talk about the true God and what it means to know God and what it means to know God in Christ. And, and, and if you remember last week, we... We even alluded to that there's a difference in between knowing of God and knowing God. Because Paul even told them, you have this, this mon- monument of, uh, or erected to an unknown God, and yet you do not know even uh, the God in which you speak. You know of Him, and yet you do not intimately know Him. Uh, and, and there is a huge difference uh, in knowing of God and knowing God. And we have to be aware of that difference because if if you did not understand the difference you might would think that Paul in Athens was given some sort of credence to uh, this idea of polytheism this idea of many gods and, and and yet at the same time what Paul was challenging the people there in Athens to do is to know God not just know of him I remember being in Cherokee with the youth a uh, handful plus years ago at this point, and as we did door-to-door evangelism, which was quite effective there, uh, we, we encountered a, a man, if not many men, who, who knew of God, who, who would even give us credence to, well, I know the Creator. They would even say he, well, the Creator was spelled with a capital C, and, and yet they did not know Christ in the, sal- 
in the salvation that we were presenting through the gospel. And so here it is that, that Paul in Athens is, is preaching the gospel. If you remember, he preaches the resurrection. He preaches judgment and the day of the Lord. And he preaches that there is a, a demand of repentance and faith to come to the Lord. And, and as, he's, as he's evangelizing there, it says there in verse 1 of 18... After this, so at some undisclosed time, Paul leaves Athens and goes to Corinth. And so here it is that we, we have to know something about this new city in which we have traveled to. If we, uh, like Paul, are traveling from city to city to city, there, there has to be some sort of knowledge in which we are going. And here it is that Corinth is, as one preacher called it, the the Las Vegas of the ancient world. Because what happens in Corinth, he says, stays in Corinth. We all know that, that funny line about Las Vegas. And, and so here it is that, that Corinth is a, a place of fornication and sexual immorality. And it was even uh, brought to my attention as one commentator was writing that, that Corinth, the city, was often used in, in ancient writings as a verb. Uh, I don't know how exactly that would look or exactly how that would sound. I'm not going to attempt it because I've already butchered a few names here in our text. But, but it, was, it was used as, as you were sinning in the sexual nature. And so here it is that Paul comes to a town that the Romans had conquered uh, 150 years before, and yet Julius Caesar demands for it to be rebuilt so that they can enjoy him and his soldiers and all of his officials that they can enjoy uh, this ancient world of Las Vegas and that they can enjoy the sexual immorality and the fornication that goes on here time and time again. And yet, at the same time, even though it was a city of great sin, it was a strategic city. It was a strategic city because it was an economic booming city. It was a politically driven city. It was strategic for the Roman Empire to, to know this place, to love this place, and to care for this place far beyond their desires of, of sex and sin. And with it being a strategic city for the government, it also becomes a strategic city for the Apostle Paul. Because here it is, as he enters into the city of Corinth, he desires to build a strong church here because from here, from this port city, now we can sail to North Africa. And we can move across the continents, and many of them actually do so, as we'll see. But here in Corinth, what we see here is really uh, some statements being made, first by Paul, and then by God, and then by Gallio. Here in our text, we see those three statements made to them, and I think that's how we're going to handle our text this evening with those three statements. And of course, that first statement is uh, Paul in verse 6, as he moves away from the synagogue, as he moves away from the Jews, and he moves now into the Gentiles first as he begins to minister within these towns. If you look back at verse 6, this this crucial thing happens within the ministry of Paul as, as he is there and he is preoccupied with the Word. He is, he is he's teaching the Word in the synagogues as he has Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. Even the way that, that Luke writes makes it seem very tedious in nature. Every Sabbath, he says. Paul is in the synagogue and he's trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. And so when Silas and Timothy find him, he's there in the synagogue because he is exhausting himself amongst the Jews and he is trying to persuade them that Jesus is indeed the Christ. And, and, and as they begin to reject his teaching, as they begin to even hate him for his teaching, he shakes off his garments and he says to them, your blood is on your own heads. Now one of the one of the interesting things that I read from F.F. F. Bruce as he was given some commentary on this, on this chapter is that, that Paul seems to be 
uh, in, in a very downcast mood by the time that he comes to Corinth. Uh, not only is he physically weary, because remember his vacation didn't go as planned last week, but now he is being uh, driven out of the synagogue, so to speak, by these, by these Jews that claim that they know the Christ, and yet they are rejecting that he is indeed the promised Messiah. And so he, he comes into Corinth, and not only is he weary when he comes, but he begins to become more and more weary as he, uh, as he exalts himself in the temple. And so here it is that, that he is exhausted, that he is in need of some encouragement. And even when his friends Silas and Timothy show, uh, they aren't there for for hugs and brotherly kisses, they are here finding Paul exhausted within the temple. And so now as he, as he meets in this city of sex and sin, he finds himself where he would think that he would be encouraged, and yet he is even more uh, exhausted. And so really at his wit's end, he... He exclaims to them, I'm done. I, I, I'm, I'm at my breaking point with you, and, and I'm going to move on to the Gentiles. I'm going to move on to where my, my message will be uh, accepted and listened to. And, 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 and here's what I love about, about Paul. Is he, he, he exclaims these hard words, right? It, this is, a, this is a, a hard action by Paul. He he dusts off his jacket. He dusts off his garments and, and he, he screams, listen, your, your judgment is on you. Now, if we remember as we journeyed through the Gospel of Matthew some years ago, we, we actually know these actions. These are actually the actions that Jesus tells his disciples uh, to commit if they go into a city and they do not uh, receive them or their message. He says, go outside of the city, dust off your shoes, and carry on to the next place. Well, here it is. That as an apostle of Christ Jesus, Paul does that very thing. And so he dusts off his clothes. Your blood be on your own heads. Your, your judgment upon you. I am going to the Gentiles. You see it there in verse 6 at the very end. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He is, he's recalibrating his ministry. No longer will I find, no longer will I seek out first the Jews, but now I will seek out the Gentiles first and foremost. And, and, I, and I love what Paul does. You see it there in verse 7. And he leaves there, and he goes to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, it says. And notice where his house is. Right beside the synagogue. You, I, I, I seem to think, uh, I, I, maybe I'm reading my own inclinations here, but I seem to think that Paul goes to the, the house next door, first because he's a Christian, but two because all those people in the synagogue can hear him. I, I think that Paul stands out on the threshold of this house and he preaches the gospel day in and day out so that all of those passing by may hear, but also because of those Jews may hear so that they may be preached to yet again. And, and you notice, don't you, that, that these Jews who were, who were so hostile to him, now they are forced to see him. Now they are forced to hear him. Now they are forced to wonder why he is in this house beside the synagogue doors. And, and then lo and behold, look at verse 8. The same people that he has just said, forget you. The, the same people that he has looked at and said, your judgment is on your head. It's the head of those people. It's the head of the Jews. It's the, the head of the synagogue who, lo and behold, he believes. And I, and I think that it's not a far-fetched conclusion to think that, that he was journeying to work one day. Uh, and he begins to hear Paul from a distance. And then he's crossing by Titius Justice's home and he he begins to hear again the message that Paul had preached every week in the synagogue, every Sabbath in the synagogue. And, and it's then that the Holy Spirit softens his heart and he believes and not only him but his household. And not only his household but all of a sudden there's, there's many 
in Corinth. After hearing Paul, we're believing and we're being baptized. You see it there at the end of verse 8. And, do, and don't miss this, that, that Crispus is the one, the first one that Luke mentions that is, that is converted here uh, in Corinth because, because it, it, it seemed to be, doesn't it? It, it, it seemed to be, if we, if we left things at, at, at verse 7, Crispus would be the last man that you would ever expect to be converted. You, you would think that Luke would move straight to all the Gentiles in the city of Corinth. And there's many upon many there. You would, you would think that it would be anybody but Crispus. And yet, Luke tells you, Crispus hears and he believes. And, and, and isn't that really just good news for us as believers who are commissioned by Jesus Christ himself to go out and be witnesses to Christ, for Christ? To others, isn't it? Isn't it good news for us to, to for us to see it being unfolded before our eyes, seeing it being played out before our eyes? That that the that the one that you would think would be the last person to ever get saved, here it is that he's the first. And it, and it's really a challenge just to keep pressing on, isn't it? it it's Paul saying, "Listen, you're." You, the judgment of the Lord is upon you. I'm an innocent man. I've done my duty. And, and yet he moves into a place where they can see him and hear him. And it's the last person that Paul expected to be saved. And he is the one that's converted. And, and you see the way that Luke writes, don't you? It's, it, it's, a, it's a ripple effect. It's Crispus and then it's his home. And it moves from his home until the community. Now that all these people in Corinth, all of these sinners, it's not a far-fetched way to say it, all of these sex addicts are now coming to Christ in, in the city where you at least expect revival to break out. Revival's breaking out, and it's through the guy that you at least expect to be saved. It's the least of these. It's... It's the ones that, that catch us off guard that are being saved before our eyes. And, and, and it's just showing you the, the marvelous salvation of the Lord. And, and all of this is happening. And can't you imagine how Paul is being encouraged? You would think that Timothy and Silas would bring the encouragement. No, he's, he's just laboring in the temple. You would think that the Jews in the synagogues, here is a Jew that's been trained in the synagogues, you would think they would be the place of encouragement. No, they're just reviling him and hating him. No, it, it's the least of these in the city. It's the greatest sinners being converted that the Lord is using to encourage Paul. And so he's standing in the doorway of his home and he is preaching and there are many believing and and yet at the same time, there's division being created. Remember, as we've been journeying through, through this story, there's, there's, there's responses to the gospel, and they always look about the same. Either you believe or you reject. Either you accept or you deny. And, and, and here it is that, that as Paul's preaching, there's, there's division being created. And, and notice that, that the way Luke writes is... is not just those who believe and those who reject Christ. It, it, it's creating these, these boundaries but, or this division between the synagogue and the Gentile people here in Corinth. Again, you have to know kind of where Paul is writing his letters, but it's here in Corinth as Paul is, is preaching and teaching as Paul is being reviled by the Jews of the synagogue, as Paul is rejoicing in Crispus and his household, and all of these Gentiles being saved, it's, it's here that he's, and, and under these circumstances, that he begins to write Romans, and he begins to, begins to wrestle with the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the church and, and Israel, and, and all of those profound questions that Paul asks there, and specifically in verses 10 and 11. What is going to happen to these Jews? What's going to happen 
to these Gentiles. We have the Jewish rejection and yet we have the Gentile acceptance. And, and you remember, don't you, that, that Paul talks about the jealousy that's arising in the Jews' hearts as, as the Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ, as the Gentiles are, are growing in numbers within the churches. It's the Jews that they're, they're despised for Paul and the church is growing. Now, as, as we kind of think about Romans 9, 10, and 11, I'm glad I'm not preaching 9, 10, and 11, um, but, because there's a lot going on in those texts, but what we can be sure of is that in no way it is the Jewish rejection here in Acts chapter 18 changing the plan of the Almighty Sovereign God. Now you have to understand kind of where we're coming from and, and, and even some of the, 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 the talk amongst Christendom today uh, that somehow, some way, things that happen here on earth is, is changing the mind of the Lord or changing uh, the, the plans of the Lord. And, beloved, that, that's not happening. Nothing takes the Lord by surprise, okay? Uh, no social unrest is taking the Lord by surprise. No, no crazy political election process is taking the Lord by surprise. Nothing is changing His mind, okay? And that includes the rejection of the Jews here in the synagogue. This doesn't take Him by surprise. And, and, and do you remember what, what Paul writes there in, in Romans 11? I think it's verse 26. He says, as he's reflecting on the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, he says that none of this, and you can imagine him even sitting and, and watching the city of Corinth, and he says, none of this has changed the redemptive purposes of a sovereign God in saving His people. And he concludes with this, he says, that every single one of God's children will be saved. And so as, as, as Paul is here and he's, he's dust, dusting off his cloaks and he's heading to the Gentiles and, and he's seeing these, these people come to faith and yet at the same time he's seeing the hate and the jealousy of the Jews grow. He's saying all of this is happening and yet at the same time God is accomplishing His purposes. And, and, and I, think that, I think that Paul is reaffirmed in this by seeing the salvations of people like Crispus and seeing the salvation of his household and, and even many here of the Corinthians that were believing and, and were being baptized and added to the number. I think it's, I think it's God's way of, of, of teaching Paul that despite the rejection that you are facing in this synagogue, I am going to draw my people unto myself. It's an encouragement, isn't it? That, that God is going to to work it out exactly in the ways that he sees fit and exactly the way he sees fit. And as, and as all this is going on, as the Lord is saving these people despite the rejection that's taking place there in the synagogue, he, he speaks to Paul. And this is that second statement that I think is so crucial within these 17 verses. You see it there in verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. Here it is that, that the Lord tells the Apostle Paul, Don't fear. And, and, and what's the only reason that he's not to fear? Because I'm with you. Now don't you think that, that, as, uh, that as the rejection and the jealousy and the hatred is is rising amongst the, 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 the Jews there in the synagogue. He, he's already, remember, he's already encountered some of these hostile Jews before. And, 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 and they're the ones that, that beat him those 39 times with the, with the rod. And, and, and you can imagine, if, if you get beat 39 times with the rod, you don't want to get beat again, okay? Um, it, it's kind of like a bad spanking from your mama. Um, you just don't want it to happen again. And, and, and so Paul, you can understand, right? He, he, he fears this, this persecution and, uh, and, and he's weary over the rejection even though he's seeing these marvelous conversions. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you, some of you have experienced this, you've, you've seen 
salvations happening all around you, and yet at the same time, those ones that you hold so dear aren't the ones coming to Christ. And you can imagine how that's burdening. Paul is, is his people. In his place, he's been going to the synagogue every Sunday, you remember. Uh, and, and, and it's these, his people in his place that are rejecting him. And so all of these marvelous things are happening, but he's still burdened in his heart for the Jews. And, and all these things are burdening Paul. All these things are making him weary. All these things are making him fearful. And it's the Lord that says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. You know, that, that, those, are, those are powerful words, and, and actually words that, that the Lord has used time and time again throughout His redemptive plan. You remember as Jesus stands on the, uh, the Mount of Ascension, he, he says, you're going to be my witnesses, and you can imagine, can't you? Uh, oh boy, uh, I've got to go into Jerusalem, and I've got to go into Judea, and I've got to go into Samaria, and I've got to somehow make it to the utter ends of the earth. And preach Jesus. And he goes, you know what? Don't be afraid. I'm with you. And we can go all the way back into the Old Testament, can't we? I love that, that text in, in Joshua chapter 5 where, where Joshua's looking at the walls of Jericho, right? He's just succeeded uh, Moses and he's now the leader of God's people. And they, they are about to confront their first major enemy. And the Lord himself shows himself to Joshua, and he says, you know what, don't be afraid, because I'm going to fight this battle for you. I'm with you. And then it's, you know, it's Elisha, surrounded by the Syrians, as he's standing on the mount with his little servant boy, and, and everywhere he looks, 360 degrees, there's, there's armies after armies after armies, and the Lord says, you know what, don't be afraid, for, for I, have, I have many more surrounding them, and, and, and he sees the the armies of the Lord surrounding even his enemies. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the disciples on, on the Sea of Galilee where the storms are, are, are rocking the boat and destroying the boat and Jesus wakes up and he says, I don't know why you're afraid, I'm here. It, it, it's, a, it's a powerful statement that, that the Lord looks at Paul in this vision and says, you know, it's the same statement that he says to the women at the tomb, they're crying and they're hysterical because, you know, someone's taken Jesus. And he says, don't be afraid. Why? It's me. I'm here. And that's the same words that he looks at Paul in this vision and says. And he says, I am with you. And so there's, there's absolutely no reason to be afraid. And if we can take all these examples from the ministry of Jesus in the Old Testament, we can understand this, that... That if God, the Lord Himself, is with you, if He's with you, there is absolutely nothing that can harm you, nothing that can cause you to fear, nothing that can bring you anxiety. If you would just simply remember and hear the words of Christ saying, don't be afraid. I'm here. And I love what, I love what the Lord says to Paul as he continues this conversation with him in this vision. He says, and I have many people in this city. Now, uh, there's some confusion, not confusion, but I'll say there's many different, uh, many different ideas, opinions on, on what, what the Lord means as he, uh, as he speaks this word to Paul that he has many people in the city. And, and I and I find myself agreeing with our best buddy in the Presbyterian world, John Calvin. It's always a safe bet, by the way. I, I find myself agreeing with John Calvin where the Lord, as he's encouraging Paul to carry on. You know, it's, it's the same words of, of Romans chapter 11, verse 26. I'm going to save my people. It, it, it's the Lord telling Paul to keep on keeping on, keep talking, keep preaching, Keep evangelizing because there's many here within this city that I'm going to draw unto myself in salvation. I have many children here. And how can they believe if they will not hear? And so you've got to keep preaching, Paul. And, and don't you see it? That as, 
that as, as, as the Lord is, 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 is giving Paul this vision, I love how Luke does it. As he moves from the vision in verses 9 and 10, he says, don't, don't fear, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. My people are here. And you can almost see how Paul's heart's encouraged. It says, and he ended up staying there 18 months because he had preaching to do. Because God had promised he's going, to, he's going to draw people in this city unto himself. And so you see that phrase, that statement from the Lord. But, but lastly, we need to quickly look at this, this third statement. And it's, it's from Gallio, the, the official there in Achaia. Because here it is that the Jews bring him before the, the official. And, uh, and they... they they bring charges against him. And, and to make a long story short, Gal, Gallio says, you know, this is y'all's business. Why don't y'all handle it? Why don't y'all handle it yourselves? And, and you see, don't you, that there's, that there's outrage. That happens here in, in the hearts of the Jews. And, and so they, they, they take... Their new leader, remember Crispus is the one that's been converted, so he's out of the synagogue. He, he's been driven out, and now they've elected a new ruler of the synagogue, and it's uh, Sosthenes. Sosthenes. That's the way the ESV Bible app pronounces it, Sosthenes. And it's Sosthenes that they take, right, and they begin to beat him right outside, right outside of the gates. Right there in front of Gallio, it seems. And, and you wonder why, don't you? Don't you, uh, don't you sit here and you wonder why? Why do they grab this man? Maybe it's because they've looked like fools in front of the tribunal. And he's led the charge because he's the leader of because he's the leader of the synagogue. But I think there's something deeper happening here. And you have, to, you have to know the letter to the Corinthians. is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians because he says this in his greeting. He says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. I think what Paul is trying to teach us here is that as he stands before the tribunal and he defends his case before Gallio, it's, it's not just Crispus, the, the first leader of the synagogue that's converted in Paul's time in Corinth. It's also the next one. And as, and as Sosthenes is declaring his, his faith in the Lord, as they're leaving the tribunal, I think it's, I think it's the hate of, of the Jews' heart as they, they grab him and they begin to beat him. And, and you notice what happens, don't you? Sosthenes leaves Corinth and he begins to travel and evangelize with, with the Apostle Paul. And it's yet just another child that God said that he had in the city that he was going to use Paul's preaching to draw unto himself. And so here it is that as we, as we close these, these 17 verses, we have Gallio paying no attention to anything that's going on in the city of Corinth, and, and yet God is sending revival to the land. You know, there's... There's details in this story that belong just to this story. I understand like the, the fact that, that the Lord promises Paul that he's not going to be hurt here uh, in the city of Corinth. He hasn't promised that yet, has he? He's, he's been beaten everywhere he's gone so far, it seems like. But there is something that remains, is that the Lord promised Paul that he was with him. And it encouraged Paul to stay for 18 months and it encouraged Paul to preach before Gallio in the tribunal and it encouraged Paul to, to keep on keeping on and we see we see many and specifically two coming to know Christ the two leaders of the, of the synagogue which, which Paul condemned to the judgment of the Lord but I think it, I think it matters to us to see that phrase, do not be afraid, for I am with you. 
Because that is the driving motivation of Paul's ministry, and so it is with us. That no matter the circumstance, and no matter the suffering, and no matter the valley we may walk through, God always says to us, as He says to Paul here, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There is no reason to fear. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do uh, thank you for the time in your word, and we thank you that through Christ we can have peace. Uh, that passes all understanding, and that we can indeed know the love of the Father that drives out fear. And so, Father, we pray that we would always rest assured that you are with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and let that be the motivation of our life, of our journey through this pilgrim land. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. All right, that, that second hymn, The Advent of Our King, is on page 12. It's to the tune of St. Thomas that we will know. Um, we'll let him play through the verse and then we'll start singing together if you'll stand. draw your attention to after the benediction we will sing the doxology together and now receive the Lord's blessing from Ephesians chapter 3 now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen, amen. 